So recently I've been turning down pretty much all requests for reviews on electric bikes with a single motor. After having ridden the MC3 all-wheel drive, I find them to be boring by comparison. The Eden from Freedair with its single rear hub motor would have been another pass had it not been equipped with two key features that I really wanted to test, one of which was too good to ignore. I still stand strong in the opinion that if you're looking at a fat tire electric bike, two-wheel drive is certainly the way to go if you plan on doing any kind of adventure riding. With that being said, the single motor on the Eden is no slouch for carrying a full-grown adult. As long as you're not eyeballing aggressive off-road terrain or extreme hills, it, in combination with everything else they've given to this bike, makes for a really good cruiser. So welcome back riders, in today's video we're taking a look at the Eden from Freedair. This is a step through fat tire electric bike. Here I'll be covering what I like, what I think can be improved, and my neutral opinions about the bike. The shipping and packaging is not usually something I cover in great detail, however there's a few things to note about well, Freedair's bikes. Protective packaging on the Eden is hands down the best I've received from any company. Freedair's gone out of their way to make sure this bike arrives unscathed and completely intact. The following list is my reasons of picking the Eden over the Saiga. As a bit of a side note, I would like to commend Freedair for their naming convention being original, easy to say, easy to remember, and not cringy. For example, it's difficult to be convinced of quality when the bike's naming convention goes something like the Happy Trail Bike or the Puck Puppy, which are both real things, by the way. Anyways, if I'm going to go with a single motor bike, I'm at least going to be as comfortable as possible, and this being their cruiser helps complement that. It also includes a front basket, rear rack, and two fenders, which I don't think the Saiga, at least at the time of recording, includes. So Freedair is going with the theme of smart electric bike. They can call it whatever they want, and I do see where they're going with this because there are some more advanced features on the bike for anything else in this price category. There is a lot of things missing from that smart bike title that could be implemented quite easily. I would certainly expect at the very least the rear taillight to be integrated into the bike's electronics so I wouldn't keep forgetting to turn it on. Adding a tire pressure monitoring system would go a long way into that smart bike title. These are easy and cheap to implement. I put one on my motorcycle for like $25. I've tested a handful of bikes which allow you to connect your phone to the bike via an app and this is usually useless with no practical purpose but for example, having automatic information sent to the bike from your phone, like your location, GPS maps, the weather, the time, estimated time of arrival, traffic conditions, this is all useful stuff which could be displayed on the heads up display of the bike so I don't have to put my phone on the handlebars. It's a big convenience which has a lot of potential. But I do get it, the bike is priced in the same bracket as most others, $1,600 at the time of recording, so I'm not expecting everything. It's just if you want that title, you gotta work for it. So what is Freedair doing with their bikes to make them stand out? Well, to start with, you get a through axle on the front wheel. That's the first electric I've seen with an actual through axle. These are tougher, can stand up to more abuse by their very nature. They have sealed bearings, are easier to remove and install, all around less headaches and built better. You also get a proper torque sensor, not a gimmicky torque switch or a cadence sensor, no, a real torque sensor which dynamically adjusts power based off of how hard you're pedaling, with each level of pedal assist adjusting how much the bike will amplify your pedal inputs. It's basically the bike version of a mech suit, making your legs feel superhuman. Where I found this to have the biggest advantage is in low speed operations, stop and go situations. The bike is fluid and predictable. It's never trying to jump away from you because you set your pedal assist too high but you want to go slower. It does exactly what you want it to when you want it. However, I noticed on the Eden, above 15 miles an hour, I very noticeably feel every pedal stroke as the motor kicks in and out. If they could smooth out the power delivery at higher speeds, this issue would be fixed. For me, the practical benefits you get with a torque sensor at low and mid speed operations outweigh this small nitpick at higher speed operations, but I felt obligated to point it out after having tested so many different bikes. With Freedair trying to heavily implement their app into the bike's operations, there's a good chance that in a more advanced version down the road, we'll be able to adjust the tune for each individual rider. That would be really nice. I did however run into one problem that appears to be a fluke with my bike because I haven't seen any other reviewers point this out. 
It was a sporadic issue that would happen randomly and then go away on its own after a few minutes. The torque sensor would appear to lose sensitivity, requiring me to apply heavy pressure to the pedals to get the pedal assist to kick in. I still had full power available at the throttle, so I didn't think it was the motor or speed controller. After contacting Frieder, they sent me a new torque sensor, and having replaced it, it fixed the issue which was good, uh, but they didn't include instructions and I'd never done this before, so you know, I was lucky enough to already have the tools I needed, having worked on so many bikes, but without instructions this is not exactly an easy part to replace if you've never done it before. Thankfully they've set up the throttle in such a way that I think is optimum, especially for this bike. It not only takes priority over pedal assist, meaning you can hold the throttle and still pedal without the bike jumping you up in power or dropping down, but it works in conjunction with the pedal assist. So if you're cruising on the throttle and you start applying more pressure to the pedals, it'll give you more power, not ignoring either of them. It's hard to explain, but this works together really well to give you a pleasant cruising experience and precise adjustments in your speed. So let's move to the number one reason, in my opinion, why anyone would want to consider a freed air bike, and that is their anti-theft GPS tracking system with notifications. Right off the bat, I'd like to point out that this is not some gimmicky, it might work sometimes in the right situations kind of selling point. It's nothing like an Apple AirTag. The bike does not rely on nearby Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals. It actually uses a cellular service, meaning that the bike's built-in GPS receiver, which is accurate down to the foot, communicates to your phone via cellular service. And as you may know, most of the country, at least here in the United States, has cellular service. And where it is true, there could be some very niche locations where the bike could be hidden outside of cell signal. At some point, it's going to find its way back into it, and then you can find your bike. And the icing on the cake here is that this does not require a subscription service. It is simply included with the bike. So you don't have to pay a subscription fee every month to find your bike. I've tested this three times in different situations, and each time has worked flawlessly. First, I tested the bike by just riding out of town where I knew there wouldn't be any kind of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals. I kept my phone off during the ride, parked the bike, walked about a quarter mile away, and was able to turn my phone on and immediately locate the bike. The second situation, I asked my girlfriend to take the bike down the road and just park it somewhere without telling me exactly where she would be. And once again, the GPS was able to lead me right to her location. The last test was the toughest, where we did find some limitations with the system, but enough confidence to know you'll still eventually find the bike. I gave it to my neighbor and asked him to ride around randomly wherever he felt like going without telling me. He didn't have a phone on him either, so there was no chance the bike would be connected to anything to help it out. After about five minutes, I loaded up the app and started tracking the bike's location. When getting directions to the bike, I noticed it did not appear to be moving, and this told me immediately that the system doesn't give live updates, instead it updates every few minutes. Somewhere along my path while following the directions, my neighbor noticed me and began following me. Eventually, I reached the destination of the last known update of the bike, and that's when my neighbor rolled up behind me. To explain, I had been following his exact path the entire time and was in fact in the exact location he was about two minutes ago. I then asked him to ride back home and I would continue to test the bike. And in fact, it did appear to be updating every few minutes until he eventually got to the house. So long as the battery is plugged into the bike, the GPS system will continue to work if it's on, off, or being ridden. They've included what appears to be a more advanced key to lock the battery into the bike than I've seen on any others. I'm sure a lock picker could open this up in a few seconds, but the amateur or average Joe on the side of the road who doesn't know what he's working with would have a hard time removing the battery from the bike without damaging its value. Before I move on to the rest of the bike's features, I just want to hammer down on how big of a selling point this is for commuters. Knowing that you don't have to pay a subscription fee, the bike can be located down to the foot anywhere there's a cellular signal is huge for commuters. Taking it to work, to the store, if it's something you actually need to use and it disappears, the chances of you getting it back are really, really good. 
They've taken their anti-theft system one step further via notifications. There's three options. You can choose which one or all of them. The bike can literally call your phone and give you a robotic voice message about its being touched. It can send you an email or it can send you a notification on your phone via the app if you give it permissions. Now these alarm options are great, certainly a step in the right direction and no complaints. However, I wish there was a way to adjust the sensitivity so that if the bike is maybe moved a few feet, then it would go off or if the wheels are in motion. But as it is right now, the bike is so sensitive that just walking by it on a hardwood floor without even touching the bike is enough to set off the notifications. So some kind of option in the app to adjust its sensitivity, maybe like a gate, if it moves outside of a certain area, then go off, it would be a lot better. Because if you turn them off due to their inconvenience, then they're not actually going to be helping you when you need them. This is not the first bike I've tested with an automatic headlight and auto dimming heads up display when it gets dark, but it is the first one that's done it properly, allowing you to manually turn on your headlights on an overcast day without the sensor turning them back off. Big thumbs up there. But for some reason they decided not to integrate the taillight into the bike's electronics. And because the headlight is automatic, I found myself constantly forgetting to turn the taillight on. This might be another me problem, but it's a smart bike. It needs to have an integrated taillight, especially since it's also a commuting smart bike. Thankfully, the taillight is bright enough to be useful and is operated off of two AAA batteries, so no button cells, but it doesn't have any sensors in it to know when you're hitting the brake, so it doesn't get brighter. I'd still recommend using a second taillight on your backpack or your helmet. As for that headlight, as usual, it's bright enough to get the job done, but should be a bit brighter. You'll want to either supplement this or upgrade it. And supplementing it, you can. Thankfully, they have a USB charge port on the bike. What they don't have is cruise control, which in most situations is a big negative for me. A lot of people just don't care about that. However, I found on this bike with the torque sensor and a really nice setup on the throttle, I'm pedaling most of the time. I'm actually hardly ever using the throttle on this bike, so the lack of uh, cruise control on a bike with a torque sensor is, I guess, not a big deal. But come on, guys, you call it a smart bike. I mean, there's two-ton vehicles on the road with cruise control. Why can't I have it on my bike? At least give us the option. Build quality on the Eden looks good and feels good. No complaints here. I especially love the inclusion of the front basket, rear rack, and fenders. I did notice while installing the front basket, it is really tight getting these wires in just the right position to where they won't bind on the basket when you turn the handlebars. So this could use some tightening up, but at the end of the day, it's not really a big deal. To their credit, for all they had to actually put on this bike, they did a good job with cable management, and it looks pretty streamlined once everything's set up. I really like that front basket design. The attention to detail in a place that's often overlooked is the rubber grommets anywhere a cable passes through the frame, on top, and hidden underneath, where they wouldn't think someone would look, there's still a grommet there. I really appreciate that. That's a thumbs up for the longevity of a bike. As for ride comfort, this is close to the Velotrek Nomad 1, which was the most comfortable bike I have ever ridden. However, this seems to cater to a little bit shorter riders. I am just a tad too big for this bike, and I can feel it in the seat post height, as well as the swept back handlebars. But I do feel that shorter riders are really going to find this bike comfortable, just from my experience with this kind of geometry. If I was to upgrade anything on this bike, it would just be the seat and possibly a suspension seat post. I love these swept back handlebars for cruisers and these ergonomic lock-on grips, which are easy to adjust by loosening the lock rings, but stay in place. They never slip. The thumb throttle with the large paddle allows you to roll your thumb down the body of the throttle for precise adjustments, and it's located right next to the right grip, so it's very intuitive. However, they're using this really generic shifter. I would prefer to see the push-pull trigger shifters that don't require you to adjust your grip to change gears. Stopping power on this bike for hydraulics is about average. However, it has really good feel in the brake levers. There is no air in these lines at all. They hit a solid wall. And they're only using 160 millimeter rotors, so this would be an easy upgrade if you needed to improve your stopping performance. But as it is out of the bike, I have no complaints.
The bike has no annoying rotor rub, which probably has a lot to do with how well it was protected during shipping. I did have to make a small barrel adjustment to the shifter to get all the gears to line up, but that was quick and easy and is common on most bikes. And the truing of the wheels is the best I've seen so far. These run absolutely smooth and true right out of the box. Traveling on flat roads that aren't beat to hell, the bike runs very smooth. There's no annoying high spots in any of the tires that cause it to wobble. And on bumpy conditions, this was a pleasant surprise. Very little noise, almost none at all. This bike is built very tight and they even added a stiff spring to the kickstand so when you do hit bumps it's not bouncing around and making a bunch of noise. And they use plastic fenders so you don't hear a bunch of rattling from the chain either. All in all, in the $1,600 price bracket, the Eden has a premium feel to it and features which surpass basically anything else in the single motor market. I wish so badly that they had a two-wheel drive option on their website. Wink, wink, maybe put one out in the future. That would be awesome. But other than that, there is really no major complaints on this bike. It's got some minor tuning issues and maybe a few little bugs they need to work out. They're still a new company. Outside of electric bike enthusiasts, this might not mean anything to you, but they're using a branded Bafang motor. In my experience, these are easy to maintenance, easy to work on. They apply more torque for their rating than other unbranded motors I've tested, and so far have never given me a single issue. They are, however, not the quietest. These are geared hub motors, and they have a bit of motor noise. When you're talking about electric bikes, this is a bit redundant, but you do notice it over something like direct drive motors. As with so many other consumer e-bikes, its speed limit is 28 miles an hour for legal reasons. However, on flat ground, this bike has no problems getting my 210 pounds to that speed limit rather quickly. They didn't skimp on the battery either, giving a nice 20 amp hour Samsung battery. For peace of mind, both the battery and the bike are UL certified. For the health of the battery and for safety during shipping, most manufacturers will send these to you at 50% charge, give or take, also known as storage charge. Unfortunately, by the time my bike arrived, the battery was completely flat, even so far as to give me a warning on the heads up display about under voltage. Freedair did assure me that the battery management system would prevent the battery from going too low and damaging the cells, but I am skeptical. Although the battery did charge up just fine, and I don't appear to have any reduced range or performance, I know from personal experience that lithium-ion batteries do not like to be kept at a very low charge for extended periods of time, so I worry about any long-term effects this might have. Range claims very wildly, as most of you know by now. Now they claim up to 90, I don't have the patience to ride that slow for that long, but in my testing, aggressive riding on heavy throttle, I was able to get over 40, and that's with back road gravel conditions, and relaxed riding on mostly smooth streets and smooth trails. While pedaling, I was able to get well over 60, uh, mainly just before I gave up and decided that was enough. I will say this, because of the addition of the torque sensor, I find myself almost exclusively pedaling this bike, rarely using the throttle, other than situations where I just need to get going from a dead stop. Because it's dynamic and always adjusting to you, getting those claimed 90 miles certainly seems possible without breaking a sweat. To sum up my thoughts of the Eden from Freedair, the only cheap components on this bike that I'd like to see upgraded are the tail light and the shifter. Everything else feels premium for its price bracket and I don't see any changes that need to be made. There are a few little bugs with the system as we touched on, but nothing deal breaking. The bike might not be a great fit for tall riders, me being 6 foot 4, but average and short riders should find this very comfortable. The GPS system, which has been reliable every time I've tested it, along with the UL certification, gives a nice peace of mind for the bike's safety and the ability to keep it for a long time. The claims of it being a smart bike still have a ways to go, but you're in the right direction. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.